Well, um, I'm Sunny Hungerford and I'm a campaign manager for Climate and Coal here at Mackay Conservation Group. Um, before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Yui people. I acknowledge that this continent always was and always will be Aboriginal land and that sovereignty was never ceded. And I ask others to take this into consideration as we go about our lives and our work. I'd also like to pay my respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging. For those of you online, feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat box and you could write which First Nations country you're on tonight. So tonight, Mackay Conservation Group is very proud to host this important webinar all about our lovely black throated finch with our special guest, Dr. Juan Molina, who is a PhD graduate and researcher at James Cook University. Hello. Kai Conservation. Hi. <laughs> um, Mackay Conservation Group is proud to host. Uh, sorry, yes, I already said that. Um, we see that the preservation of biodiversity is extremely important and the prevention of species extinction should be a priority for humanity as every plant and animal is an important part of our ecosystem. Our group has lobbied for the protection of the black throated finch for many years and we will continue to do so. We thank you all for coming tonight, both here in Mackay and online. And I'm sure the finches would be pleased to know that you all um, care about them also. So just a couple more housekeeping things. Um, I'll ask you online to keep yourselves on mute. I wish I could ask the hoons down the road to keep themselves on mute as well, but that's not working. Um, and put your questions in the chat box. We will get to questions towards the end um, of the webinar. So, um, I'd just like to uh, tell you a bit more about our special guest tonight, Dr. Juan Muller Laguna, who he has done quite a lot of research on the black throated finch southern subspecies. Juan was born in Spain and studied environmental sciences in Barcelona, where he became interested in conservation. He has finished his master's degree and has worked on issues like bird poaching, seabird conservation in Malta and field research in Mexico. Juan continues to work with his former supervisor to develop the use of acoustic monitoring devices to find black-throated finch populations. Welcome, Juan. Hello, everyone. Um, should I share my screen now? Uh -huh. Sure, whichever suits you. Yeah. All right, well, uh, before I start, I'd like to extend my acknowledgement to uh, the traditional owners of where I'm making this presentation from in Townsville, uh, the Bindal, uh, Bindal and Wulgurukawa uh, people. Um, so before I start on the case of the Black Red Finch, I'd like to introduce a bit more why this title uh, I've titled the name of my presentation and also it was the title of my PhD, Understanding Uncertainty to Inform Conservation, Tools to Protect the Endangered Black Red Finch, and what is this all about, this uncertainty? Um, so, well, let me see, yes. Uh, so you see, conservation is a scientific discipline that um, deals with cases of emergency, right? Uh, maybe it shouldn't be like that. Maybe we should be doing a bit more work towards uh, preventing things to go uh, into a threatened uh, status in the first place. But the reality is that over the last hundreds of years, um, we the number of um, extinctions has skyrocketed. And right now the International Union uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature classifies more than 30,000 species as threatened around the world. And there are many more that are under these status at a national or regional level. Um, with that level of conservation, uh, we like it or not, we might we need a lot of resources, right? 
And uh, putting these resources might be through a direct uh, input, uh, maybe make, maybe uh, making management or also um, putting uh, resources in the form of people or time, uh, but also indirectly. So maybe uh, promoting industries that are more sustainable or um, by doing this prevention that I was talking about before. So my main interest for my PhD was, uh, what if, if we have these resources, but we still don't know how to invest these resources? Um, there are many species that are endangered that we still don't have a full grasp and, or understanding on how, what are the main threats, how is their biology, and how to combine these two factors to make effective management. So to solve that, we have two routes. The first route would be to just with what we have put money or resources rather into conservation and see what is the outcome with the information that we have right now, or invest part of that time and money first into learning more about these species and then put the money into management. Um, and these two approaches might have some pros and cons and I'll explain to you in practical examples from here in Australia. So this creature that you see here in the screen is the woylie. Um, it's a species of betong that used to occur in the Northern Territory, Victoria and New South Wales. And right now it's just restricted to Western Australia. Um, scientists and conservationists caught on pretty early, pretty early on that the species was on decline and it was classified as critically endangered. And in the uh, 80s, uh, in Western Australia, uh, there was a program to reduce the number of foxes because they were found to be the main cause of decline for the woylie. This um, project to uh, decrease the number of foxes through baiting was very successful and it managed to reduce the amount of foxes uh, in the area. But um, the problem is that after 20 years of um, putting this management effort, and seeing an increase in the woylie, um, the population started crashing again. What happened is that by controlling the population of foxes, which controlled cats, the number of cats increased dramatically. And then, um, sorry, I'm getting a message that my, my slides might not be on full screen. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, um, yeah, it's not on full screen. Uh, let me see. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Let me see. Let me try this again. Give me a second. Can you see it on full screen now? Yes, thank you. Perfect. All right. Um, so as I was saying, the number of cats after 20 years of um, management increased dramatically. And uh, that was driving the numbers of oilies down again. So effectively, this was a case where doing management with limited information actually resulted in inefficient or even negative outcomes. The opposite is the case of the Christmas Island peepers trail, where as soon as the 1984, there were surveys monitoring these species. And we identified that the species was on decline. This monitoring kept happening over the years, well into the 2000s. And by 2009, where the species was declared to be in a, an emergency situation and the response was to be uh, critical to save it, within months, the uh, species went extinct. So this is an example where delaying that conservation action in favor of doing research to monitor the populations was actually a net loss and an irreplaceable uh, loss of a species. So the kind of the motto of my PhD was um, using tools that can help quantify uncertainty, this divide between doing management with limited information or um, just act while we have the time to do something about uh, a decline, uh, can help in optimizing the way we invest the, these resources and the, especially the time that we have to do conservation. And that's how it came to the case of the Black Fair Fringe. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you are familiar with these species, but with that map that you can see on the left uh, is the full distribution of the Black Fair Fringe um, 100 years ago, let's say. Um, 
it is a species that it's endemic to northeastern North Queensland. And that light gray area there is the full distribution of it. Um, the species is now separated in two subspecies, a northern one that occurs mostly in the Cape, in Cape York, and a southern one that used to occur pretty much uh, from the divide with the northern subspecies around the Atherton tableland all the way down to New South Wales. Um, the problem is that in the last 40 to 50 years, we've seen a decline of the southern subspecies of almost uh, an 80%. I'll show you a little bit better with the presences, but um, this was enough to declare the species endangered. Um, I'm sure you, you, you hear just so you can see better the decline. This is not just um, the, whole, the whole area as you saw in the map before. This is actually the occurrences that we have of the species before the year 2000, the red points that is. And these are the ones that we have after the year 2000. So in red, we have the points that we have in the last 21 years. And in gray, we have the points that we had before. So let me see if I can point out here. Uh, if you see that red dot that I just brought up, the main two populations that we know are remaining occur around Townsville and this area in central Queensland in the Alice Tableland. And this will be important because especially this area that you can see here, which we believe is to be the healthiest population of black cherry finches that is left, um, coincides uh, largely where uh, the Adani Carmichael mine is going to be built. Um, this is a paper that came out um, in 2019 by one of my supervisors, April Risai. And here you can see, uh, this is based on a, a environmental model on how the habitat of the finch has been reduced over the years. This is the historic habitat. Uh, let me see if I can bring the pointer again. Historic habitat, the habitat after the year 2000 and the habitat after the year 2015. Um, contraction of 88% in 40 to 50 years. And the bird is now classified as presumed extinct in New South Wales, endangered under Queensland law, and also endangered on a national level under the BBC Act. Um, the reason for this decline, um, several. Um, it has to do mostly with changes in land use, uh, grazing pressure, uh, changes in fire regimes and the introduction of invasive plants like weeds or bushes have changed the structure of the habitat, reducing the numbers. But most evidently, uh, clearing has been the one of the things that have concerned most the scientific community. And the latest example, as you many of you would know, is the Adani Carmichael mine, which, unless numbers have changed recently had approval to clear 16,500 hectares of black cherry finch habitat. So with this case, um, how do we go about proposing conservation? Um, we have this problem of emergency, but we also don't know a lot about the key things that we need for understanding how to do conservation of the finch. We still don't know about, um, or we still don't know a lot about the, um, its foraging requirements, what sort of seeds it eats. Uh, we don't know much about its movement. We don't know much about the way it nests or the requirements for it to nest. And we still have contradicting evidence about what sort of habitat might be ideal to do conservation. Of. It also doesn't help that the numbers have reduced so much that now doing any sort of research with the finch is hard and costly. And um, it is also pretty hard to uh, find because they inhabit these open woodland savannas where um, locating a, such a small bed makes uh, research just very, or data collection is just very hard. Um, so with that in mind, I set up uh, one main aim and two objectives for my research. The first one was just basically provide tools that can assist in the conservation of black red finch shelf and subspecies. And I divided these in two key objectives. First of all, assess, assess that uncertainty that I was talking about and identify key research questions to protect the black red finch. And two, once those questions were identified, just address a couple of them. I divided my project in four chapters. Uh, the first one that was just um, finding uh, threats and research, research priorities to protect the black red finch. The second one, which was measuring that uncertainty uh, 
in a quantifiable way. So we can have a work frame to make decisions based on what is the priority and what's going to bring more conservation value. A third one that uh, was basically a mapping of which areas are good for conservation. And a fourth one where I studied um, the possible impacts that uh, invasive weeds might have on the finches. For this talk, um, I will talk about all of my results, but in the first part of the talk, um, I will focus on the three chapters that have to do more with that assessment of uncertainty and the two problems that I address with mapping and uh, invasive weeds. So I'll start with my chapter on assessing uncertainty. And uh, to do that, I used this interesting concept that was developed for economical studies. It's called value of information. And if we think about um, conservation in terms of uh, not money, but resources, um, we can split that dilemma that I showed you before about doing research to, with, sorry, doing management with uh, what we know right now compared to first doing some research and then doing management with more information with the way we would invest money to get a return, right? So we have two options. We can even invest money blindly or not blindly, but with the information that we have right now and expect um, an investment. I'll put my pointer here. So we have a bag of money and we want to get an investment over time, or we can spend a little bit more time to gather more data and see how that investment might go and then put that investment and get a return, right? Um, if we think about that, um, Sorry, before that, that difference between um, that first scenario and the second scenario is what I would call uh, value of new information because it shows us the total benefit of investing time and resources in collecting more data. If we translate this to conservation, we don't think about it in terms of money, but in terms of conservation value, right? We have a present value of conservation that could be, I don't know, the amount of birds that we have of a particular species. And we want to improve the status of that species, right? So we put a time frame, and we want to, by doing management, improve uh, that status. Um, the expected change that we might get down the line might depend depending if we just do management with what we know right now, uh, which might be particularly problematic if we don't know a lot about the species or we can invest some of that uh, money and time to do research and then do management with more information. But we might be having troubles, running into troubles like the oily, where, uh, sorry, well, like the oily, like the PPC or the bat, because uh, we might run out of time to do anything effective. Um, so I just took this model and I did what is called a value of information analysis. Um, and I'll just walk you through um, what that is and how I went about it. Um, so to do a value of information analysis, um, I base my data on just uh, expert uh, consultation. Uh, the idea of value of information is that we get a good representation of the knowledge that we have of the Finch right now. And uh, that knowledge is better captured if we get a room full of expert the Finch. Uh, and uh, as diverse as they can be, also because some might have different perspectives and they might bring all that to the table. So the more, the bigger that group is and the more diverse it is, we might get a better, a more accurate representation of uh, the current amount of information that we have about the species. And we ask them to do participate in a consultation or elicitation um, phase where they decided the components for the analysis. Don't worry, I'll get into what components are in a second. And also, once we decided for those, uh, we asked them to provide basically future estimates depending on the type of management and research that we do. Just to clarify this, um, these components that I was talking about are divided in three types. The first type is to put set objectives for conservation. So that would be any sort of target on what do we want to achieve uh, down that line in that scheme that I show you. So that could be, I don't know, uh, improving the number of birds that we have right now or maintaining it or, I don't know, extending the area, the total area that they occupy. Um, the most important bit about this is that we don't only set the targets, but we also set a deadline. So say five years, 10 years, 15 years, doesn't matter. 
the second part, the second component that uh, they decided was uh, threats, which is basically all of the processes that might be affecting uh, that not achieving those objectives. So that could be we have a mine, uh, we have um, um, just grazing in most properties where black fur finches occur and that's driving down the populations or maybe we have an invasion of um, shiny apples which is a type of bush and that might be affecting the habitat of the finch the last component was based on those threats and it was proposing just management that we can do um, to solve those problems once those were decided um, well first of all uh, those were decided in my case, in my study, in two workshops in which 15 experts participated. Uh, experts included um, people from the Black Finch Recovery Team, which is a government appointment group to propose to give recommendations on research and management. Um, the Department of Education and Science from Queensland, CSIRO, Bird Life, academics from three different universities, and even private consultants. Um, for the components that they decided, I'm just gonna run you through them pretty quick on the interest of time. So basically they decided that the deadline that we were gonna go for was 10 years. And the three objectives were, the first two were about maintaining the area that uh, we have right now of the finch. So avoiding further declines that we did that with two different metrics, the extent of a current and the area of occupancy. It doesn't matter that much what is the difference. And if you have a question about what these things are, we can chat about it later. And the last one was about securing the populations that we have. Um, out of these three, the main thing or the main message to take away is that experts were already very conservative in the sense that um, right now the objective is to avoid further declines rather than trying to improve. The finch because the uh, status of the finch right now is quite precarious so we just want to maintain what we have for now. Uh, in terms of the threats we came up with I think it was 18 threats but we narrowed them down to 10. Again I'm not going to run you through all of them but I can show you that we grouped them in five categories. A first category that had to do with clearing of habitat just removing trees and grasses and just changing the habitat to something like a mine. The second one had to do with fragmentation. By doing clearing uh, across the distribution, you separate the, or you divide the habitat and you might be limiting the access to resources. Um, the third one was access to foraging resources. So that would be mainly seeds. How you change the landscape might limit just access to seeds uh, throughout the year or that particular, particularly critical parts of the year. Uh, fourth one was habitat structure. So how you change the composition of the habitat might be also uh, affecting uh, access to resources. And the last one, which was access to nesting resources. So trees or any other sort of um, distribution of habitat that makes it easier for them to nest. Um, same with actions. I'm not gonna mention all of them, but they are divided in four. First one, which was protect habitat, just uh, remove um, any sort of land use uh, that could affect the black red finch. The second one, which was more of sharing the space by reducing pastoral uses. So still have pastoralism and cow grazing mostly, um, but uh, bring it down a little bit to make uh, be able to share the space for conservation and pastoral uses. A fourth one, which had to do with doing active management in the areas where we have pastoralism and uh, conservation of the finch. And a fourth one, we had to do purely with controlling exotic vegetation that is uh, shrubs or grasses that are introduced and might be affecting um, the habitat for the finch. Once we decided all of these, we presented with, uh, to experts something like this. Um, Again, quickly on the left, you had the threats that would be again, clearing, um, grazing, fire uh, or the, the effects of fire. Um, that weights column is something we ask the experts to do, which is rank these threats according to their importance. And then on the top there, you had the actions, which were all of these proposed management that um, was used to solve these problems. Um, the way we run it was we asked the experts to get themselves into a hypothetical situation where 
only one action was being taken place. So in this case would be, for example, seed productivity. And tell us on those 10 years that we decided for, what would happen to the finch if we only manage for grazing? So no other threat is in action. This is a hypothetical situation, of course. And the only thing that we're doing about it is manage grazing. We did the same. Uh, well, we also asked them to give us an optimistic, uh, pessimistic, and their best estimate. And we did the same with all actions for all threats. So same again. What if only seed productivity has an effect and we only start removing uh, shrubs? Um, Finally, um, we also asked them to tell us what will happen if we don't do anything about it, if we just wait these 10 years with all these threats acting and we really don't take any action to solve. I'm gonna show you the results of these, but first of all, I want to uh, make it very clear that these first two um, results that I'm gonna show you, um, are not the results of that value of information. They are just to highlight how the experts perceive the threats and the management actions. So this first graph here uh, shows which threats were considered more important for the experts. Um, on the left here, you have that percentage of importance. So just take it as a ranking on which uh, threat is most important. And in case you're not familiar with this type of graph, these lines here show the average. And the bigger that the box and the line is, it means that um, we had a wider variety of responses. So basically there was less consensus on um, what was the actual ranking of that threat. Um, I'm not gonna run you through all of them, but what I want you to take away is, first of all, that all of them overlap. So there is not one clear threat that is above all of the rest and uh, we should address, address that first. All of the threats are important and should be addressed. But in this red box here, I've marked the three um, threats that had to do with habitat clearing. And again, although there is a wide diversity of responses and they overlap with the rest of actions, all of them have a pretty high average above the rest. and it just goes to show, and also they are very similar. So it just goes to show that although the other ones are important, clearing might have, or it is perceived as the key threat for the lacquer finch. This graph here um, shows um, the outcomes of the actions. So um, just for you to understand a little bit better, uh, on the bottom here, we have all of the actions that were proposed. On the left there, we have uh, the percentage of benefit that we're gonna win by doing that management action. Let me put that in, an, in another way to make it more understandable. So that top line here at the 100 is the current uh, conservation value that we might have about uh, of the finch. So that is basically an average of the amount of extent that we have of habitat that the finch is occupied right now also the number of birds that we have right now. So anything between here and here is an expected loss of conservation value in 10 years, right? Um, so as you can see, this first um, column here shows what happens if we don't do anything about it, if we don't do any conservation management. And experts um, estimated that we might be losing something about the 38% of the current conservation value. That is, again, an aggregate of extent and number of birds. And if we look at the rest, the main thing that just caught my attention is that they're all looking pretty dire. So regardless of which action we take, uh, we are expecting a decline. No, it doesn't matter what we do. But that said, uh, this red bar here marks uh, the action that had most was more, most beneficial for management, and that was land sparing. Land sparing is just putting uh, land aside for conservation and not having any other sort of land use that is not conservation. Uh, so no grazing, um, obviously no extractive uh, industries like mining. But I quickly ran 
into a problem, which is land sparing might be very effective, but how feasible it is to just promote land sparing, putting aside land for conservation for the black red finch as a general uh, rule of thumb. And well, although this might be a bit uh, sad, I don't think that is feasible. So, um, so yeah, uh, after all, uh, I, what I decided is before I move into the results of the analysis, what I did is I had to repeat the analysis to make sure that we gave also a response that was within what is feasible for management. So what I did was separate um, this, this uh, analysis into two scenarios, one where land sparing was possible and one where land sparing was not a possibility. And these are the results. Uh, this uh, graph might look a little bit complicated, so let me walk you through it. Um, on the first column here, you have that scenario where land sparing is possible, right? We know that is the best solution. So if we can just put aside land for conservation, how can we improve the, 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 the how can we not improve because we're not gonna improve it, but uh, how can we prevent a major loss of the conservation value of the finch? That black line here shows that baseline value of not acting, that dark, uh, light gray, shows um, what happens if we implement the best action. So that would be land sparing. And the results of the analysis, which shows us how much better can we get at management by doing research on the rest of um, management actions and their effectivity and how they can address individually different um, threats. Um, I want you to pay close attention because you might not even be able to see it. It's just tiny little bit of red. So that is, by investing a lot into research, we are not gonna improve the conservation value that we can get just doing general land sparing. Um, so yeah, that is um, both promising and a bit depressing because uh, it means that we don't need to invest that much money or time into doing a lot of research, but at the same time, this is the scenario where land sparing uh, was possible and we don't know if we can do that. So what happens if land sparing is not a possibility? This is the same graph, but for the other alternative where land sparing was not on the table. And as you can see, this light gray area, which is implementing the best action, uh, it doesn't matter which action, uh, the, we might have different ones for different objectives or different um, threats, um, is smaller than land sparing. We knew that, but the interesting bit is that the value of doing research increases the value of conservation, which is this gray area, by almost double. So in this scenario, putting money and time into doing research is way more valuable for what we can do for the management of the Finch. Um, the sad bit here is that even if we put all of that money and time into doing research and almost double the value of conservation actions that we can have, this is still lower than just doing management. So again, land sparing might not be feasible, but it is the best solution that we have right now. So the findings of this study were, first of all, land clearing is the primary concern for the experts. Second, that a decline over the last next 10 years is expected regardless of the decision or the action that we take. Three, land sparing is the most effective, effective action as a non-specific solution. We don't need to do more research to know that land sparing is gonna work. And that, that makes sense because if a lot of the threats have to do with clearing and uh, land uses, if we avoid all of those threats altogether by just putting land aside for conservation, um, we don't really need to know how to manage. For um, ecological research has negligible, negligible benefits when implementing land sparing is possible. But again, we want to provide useful um, outputs for conservation. So, if land sparing is not a possibility, where do we invest into research to make sure that we 
improve the conservation value of our management. And before I go into show you this, I want to say also that this is an analysis and a tool that is used to orient the decisions that we make for conservation, but it is not a final solution, right? Um, the reality is that we don't only need to do land sparing or manage cattle grazing, we can do all of it together. So again, take these results as a orientation to what has more value, where can we put our money and our time to improve conservation, but keep in mind that we can do all of these actions at the, at the same time. So what I'm going to show you here is based on the value that these threats had, that based on the that ranking that the expert gave us, and the uncertainty in the responses, so the more uncertainty on how to manage a particular threat, um, and the most important that threat was overall, putting research into that threat and how to manage it is going to bring us more value from conservation. Does that make sense? Um, and what you can see here is on the right, the list of the threats that we came up with. And this um, wheel that you can see here shows the proportion in relative to the other action, uh, sorry, the other threats uh, according to their importance. So the bigger a threat is in this wheel, if we do research on how to try to manage that uh, particular threat, we're gonna gain a higher conservation value. So for example, H9, which has to do with landscape, landscape configuration, if we manage to understand how landscape configuration affects the finch and how to address the problems that might be resulting of it, we'll get way more conservation value than investigating the same for what's the problem with nesting spots. Um, the three main um, takeaway messages were that all of the threats that have to do with land clearing, precisely because of that impact that they had, uh, also have a high value for research. Um, anything that has to do with seed availability, that is uh, seeing if we had a decline in seed productivity overall, uh, if that seed is available through the year, or it might be, um, uh, we might not have enough seeds at a particularly dry or um, cold time of the year is a problem. So investigating, uh, any problems that have to do with seed availability and how to manage it are going to have a high value. And again, that landscape configuration, uh, where the three cane areas where having an investment is going to bring more value for conservation. That said, um, I don't know how we're doing with time. I think I still have like five more minutes. Um, I'm gonna run way quicker through this, chap this chapter because um, I really wanted to go in depth with uh, what can we do in terms of research and management and a bit less on how the, I've done all the methods for um, others in part particular questions. So if you have any question about how I got to these conclusions and how I did these methods, ask me um, at, the end of the, at the end of the presentation, but for now I'm just gonna run you through my uh, conclusions um, on First, uh, where to put um, conservation areas, where what areas in Queensland have a higher value to protect. And also what I learned also about the um, foraging behavior of the finch. So first, um, the main problem that I ran into to address the problem of where to uh, find conservation areas is that um, savannas, the main area where uh, black fur finches live, are highly seasonal, right? We, um, these areas um, have very regular seasonal uh, patterns. So rain can be highly localized and it can change a lot from year to year. Um, and this determines um, the availability of seeds that are present in the landscape, right? If we get a uh, big rain, we get uh, quick sprouting grasses and uh, the amount of seeds, which are resources that we have available for the finches might change a lot from one year to the next and from one month to the next. As a response, uh, most granivorous bears, that is bears that eat uh, seeds, have um, uh, adapted to understand habitat suitability, that is the availability of uh, resources as a dynamic condition that changes over time and to adapt to it, um, 
they have developed these strategies, which mostly have to do with moving in the landscape to find these resources like water or sea. Uh, this might be problematic in highly fragmented areas because if we compartmentalize the landscape in areas that might be inaccessible from one to each other, uh, these pairs that rely on moving from one to the next to find seeds or water might not be able to do so. And therefore, that's how we might run into a local extinction. Um, therefore, if we invest in protecting areas that are connected to each other, we kind of um, buffer to afford that risk of what if we have a bad time of the year where we don't have enough seeds? Uh, because the finches, even if that area is bad, they can move somewhere else. Um, we saw that in the 90s uh, with this paper that put out that uh, granivorous birds in uh, open woodland in savannas in Northern Australia were overall declining with the particular uh, particularly critical case of the paradise part, which was uh, went extinct on 19 But even this decline was seen in the black turtle finches as far as 1999. So how the black turtle finches respond in scenario? Well, um, first of all, what do we know about how they move? Uh, the answer is that we don't know a lot. Uh, as I said, doing research on these birds is a bit hard. But we do have a little bit of data based on uh, tagging and radio tracking of these finches. Um, we do know that they're pretty predominantly sedentary if they have access to resources and water, sorry, to seeds and water around their nest, they will move more than 250 meters. But in the case that um, accessing those seeds and water might be a bit harder. We do know based on observations that can that they can move up to three kilometers a day. Not only they can move up to three kilometers a day, but there have been instances where the same finch has been seen up to 16 kilometers away from the area that it was tagged in about 49 days. This might be even less time because this is based on tagging a bird somewhere and seeing it again uh, in another area, but they might have been able to cover that distance in way less time. However, the triggers on why this movement happens are not very well understood. We think that they might have to do with a response again on the accessibility of resources, but um, we are just hypothesizing here. So my questions for the study were, First of all, how is this weather variability affecting black red finches? And two, how can we incorporate this factor into saving areas for conservation? Again, I'm not gonna go a lot into the methods, but all of these results that I'm gonna be presenting are based on a dynamic species distribution model. This is just a fancy way of saying, I we just use stats to correlate um, the conditions at which uh, the environmental conditions that is, or weather conditions uh, that a uh, finch was seen. Every time a, a finch was seen, that is. So uh, if, I, if a finch was seen in October of 2019, um, I associate that observation with temperature and rain that happened in that month, the last three months, the last six months, and the up to a year. And with that, I managed to put together um, predictions of what do good weather conditions look like for, um, for a finch? Um, I projected these uh, conditions to make maps for each individual month uh, in the period of 1998-2017 uh, with um, an additional um, refinement of the map using um, the ecosystem types that they occur, because if you can see here, uh, this map, some of these maps would predict that finches would occur in the Gulf, where we know that they are not there. So ju you just need to know that uh, we need a little bit more refinement there to uh, separate areas where that we can classify as good or suitable for the finch and areas that are bad or unsuitable for the finch. Um, the result of these maps, um, or as a result of these maps, I calculated the total amount of area that we had in a particular month in these um, 20 years, 
So um, what you're looking at here is again, one of these box um, graphs where on the left, you have the amount of square kilometers that we have of black red finch habitat that is suitable habitat and how that changes over the year, right? In those last 20 years. Um, I'll show you better at this. Oh, I didn't put it. So um, the, the takeaway message here is that at the beginning of the year, we have way more area. And as the conditions get drier, the amount of habitat declines. So the finches have to stick to areas that are suitable and are smaller because those resources are more concentrated. Water is less abundant on the landscape and they need to focus on water holes or other areas of permanent water. And again, as the rainy season starts again, um, we get more grasses and more seeds and the uh, total amount of habitat that the finches can access increases. This is the same graph, but um, looking at the average for the year. Um, so again, this would be the total amount of habitat that was available through the year 1998. And the takeaway message from this graph is that we have a extreme variability from year to year, right? We have years like this one or this one where the availability between the months was pretty low. So maybe January was not that different to July and it was pretty high overall. Well, we have years like uh, 2007 that where the variability was extremely high. So the finches have to quickly um, uh, adapt to a shrinking environment or a, a expanding environment. Um, just to visualize this a little bit better, this is the same, but um, uh, the so we can see trend. And the main takeaway message here, apart from this wild variability, is that overall, if we draw a line here, we also seeing a decline in the, in the habitat. So um, I cannot assure because the data is not enough that there may be a decline based on climate, but we seem to have an overall um, reduction of the total uh, space of suitable habitat available for the finches. So, to the first question, how is weather variability affecting available black red finch uh, habitat space? First of all, we can identify uh, seasonal patterns. So we know that at the beginning of the year, um, there is uh, way more habitat than on the drier months of the year. And second, that there is extreme interannual inter variability. So that means that even if we can identify these yearly patterns, the fact that years are so different creates a lot of uncertainty on what is going to be the total amount of space that we have available for the finch at any given point. Um, the other takeaway message, which again is very um, hypothetical, I don't have hard evidence for this, is that we might be seeing, uh, starting to see a decline due to changes in weather that again might have to do with a possible change in, or, or climate change rather. Um, so how can we incorporate this temporal variability to find suit uh, suitable ha uh, habitat? Um, what I just did is something very simple. I just got these maps. These maps are separated into little squares, little pixels, and each of those maps, uh, sorry, uh, each of those uh, little pixels, we can assign a value of if the habitat was suitable or unsuitable. And I just classified those little pixels into four categories. The ones that stayed uh, suitable, uh, mostly suitable over the 20 years were classified as core. So the ones that stay over 75% of the time. Um, the ones that uh, stayed suitable 75 to 50% of the time were classified as occasional. The ones that were 50 to 25, they were classified as marginal. And the ones that were less than 25 were classified as neg negligible. Uh, on top of that, we, um, put a threshold for the amount of distance that the finches can move. That's uh, just if there is a core habitat, a very good habitat located to an area that is very far away to another good area, uh, the risk of having a bad month where the finches cannot access water or seeds is um, particularly dangerous because if they have, don't have access to move to those other areas to find resources, might result in a local extinction, even if the habitat is very good. The result of this is this map. Um, um, in uh, purple, you can see 
the three lower classifications, that is occasional, marginal, and negligible. And in orange, um, I've marked the core habitat, that is the habitat that stayed um, suitable for the most time, which we can call a stable habitat. Not only suitable, but also stable, stable in how good it is. So there is less risk of extinctions due to natural conditions like uh, droughts or floods or any extreme weather event. Um, I also coded it by suitability. We don't need to get into this, but basically the, the more intensely red or orange it is, the better it is. And as you can see, uh, most of this great habitat is around here in Townsville. And this region here, which is the Alley Stable Land, uh, which is in central Queensland. And um, a lot of it the, about this region is again where um, the Adani Carmichael mine is being developed. Um, before I move on from this, let me make very clear that this is not a specific, um, or it doesn't show specifically the um, where good habitat is because there's many other factors like the type of flood management that is being done in those areas or what is the, the current uh, habitat in those areas. This just shows where areas are less prone to these extreme weather events. So they might be more stable and therefore might be more beneficial or more efficient for conservation. But again, this needs to be complemented with and surveys to see the condition of the habitat. I think I went well over time. Um, sorry for that. Um, I can show you a little bit. Again, I'm just gonna talk really quickly about the, the seed experiment. I'll run you very quick through it. Um, so basically what I wanted to know here is what is the role of new seeds on the diet of finches? Um, to do so, I just compared it to all the finches that were not in danger. And um, I did this uh, by carrying on an experimental experiment in captivity in which I gave a captive population of finches the choice to eat um, a diversity of seeds. Um, first to understand if finches are selective at all, if they care about the seeds that they eat at all. And second, to see how, how bold they are to explore and eat novel seed types. Um, the four uh, finch types that I chose were, of course, uh, the southern black red finch, the northern subspecies, which uh, is not classified as endangered, but is very similar, of course, the long-tailed finch, which is the most closely related species to the black red finch and is not endangered, and the zebra finch, which is a wide, widespread uh, species that is also granivore, but has very different um, foraging behavior because it's a completely nomadic species, so it moves a lot through the landscape uh, to find resources. I presented them with four seed types. I'm not going to go individually in each one because the takeaway message is not which seeds did they choose, but if they are selective or if they are both. Um, just so you know, we had four um, aviary seeds, that is seeds that they were already used to eat in captivity, and four seeds that occur naturally, but they never tried before. So I had four experimental designs. The first one where I showed them um, all of the aviary seeds, the seeds that they were familiar to in the same bowl, in exact same quantities, let them feed for, um, an hour and I came back to see what they had eaten or not eaten. The same experiment, but instead of putting all of the seeds in the same plate, putting them in separate plates to see if that affected their selectivity. And before I jump into the other experiments, I thought it would be clear to show you the results of these experiments. Again, it is not important which seeds did they chose. It's important just to see how selective they were. And regarding how selective they were, um, BTFN stands for Northern Black Red Finch, the non-endangered one. BTFS stands for the Southern Black Red Finch, the endangered one, long-tailed finch, and zebra finch. And this is the results of the mixed aviary seeds. The takeaway message here is that, again, overlapping is very high. So they don't seem to have clear preferences, none of the finches, if anything, the finch that had most preferences was the zebra finch, which is the uh, most widespread species and one of the most common ones. So 
the takeaway message again is that southern black fur finches don't seem selectable. They don't seem to care that much what they were eating. Same goes for when the seeds were separated. The fact that the seeds were separated did have an effect on the overlap among choosing one seed or the other. They seem to have more preferences. But again, these preferences are pretty, pretty similar, right? Again, here they, they increase, but the species that had most preferences was again, the zebra finch. So this is important to make an argument on how finches might be selective or not. That might have an implication on uh, conservation, but the first statement on, hey, they might be in danger because they are very picky with the food that they eat, doesn't seem to be clear. Let me explain that later. The third experiment that I did, which is my favorite, was exposing them to these new seeds when they had seeds that they were familiar uh, also available. This experiment was done to show how um, explorative these features are, right? So if they are presented with a new type of seed, uh, how bold are they to try these seeds and how adaptable they are to new uh, species of uh, grass appearing in their habitat. Um, this graph is a little bit uh, hard to get into, but the main thing to see here is if the, the further what we have about that line um, represents how many seeds they were willing to try, right? So if they are high on this particular first um, column here, they try at least one, means that they were very willing to try at least one new seed. If we move along, they were very willing to try at least more than one seed. If we move along, try more than two. And the last one was try all of the seeds. Now, again, black turret finches, both north and south, and long tail finches were, were very similar in the sense that they were very explorative and they really wanted to try all of the seeds, while zebra finches seem to be, again, the most picky of the bunch, right? They were way willing to try one of the seeds and they were extremely against trying all of the seeds. So they would rather stick with the, the seeds that they already knew rather than be explorative and bold about what they try. So knowing this, I jumped into the last experiment, which was showing these new seeds just to see what was the selectivity, just to show any possible differences that they had with the ivory seeds. Um, again, take away message here, doesn't matter which seeds they choose, but the fact that um, zebra finches consistently were the pickiest species. So conclusions, black fur finches are not significantly picker than any other finches that are not threatened, so that doesn't seem to be a main problem. Zebra finches are pickier, which was a surprise initially, but might also be explained by their foraging habitat. Maybe by moving more, they are able to maintain that pickier um, uh, foraging behavior. Three, black fur finches are very willing to explore and feed on novel exotic seeds, so that might not be a problem. And also a uh, consideration that this lack of sele selectivity, although uh, shows that does shows us that um, being exposed to novel seeds might not be a problem for them, can also have conservation considerations because maybe if we have seeds that are of less quality or even toxic, black sugar finches might be more willing to try them, right? So this is also, although the results of the overall study were negative, this is also something that we should keep into consideration for doing conservation. Um, and the last thing is that these seeds, even if they are, they don't have that negative impact in the sense that they don't limit the amount of food that the uh, fringe can access, they might actually be able to change the structure of the landscape by covering all of the land and not allowing um, access to the ground. So in a sense, even if the seeds can be eaten, um, they might not be able to be accessed because these exotic uh, weeds tend to cover all of the grass layer and um, just physically impede access to seeds. Um, that's it, sorry, I think I went way over time, and, but I think we can move on. Wow, thanks Juan, that was absolutely amazing. Um, thank you so much and um, yeah, I mean, 
I certainly found that, you know, very concerning, but extremely interesting. So we really appreciate that, um, you explaining everything so well. Um, we are running quite a bit over time. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow up on the questions um, afterwards via email. Um, I'm going to speak very shortly now about the situation of the black-throated finch out at the Adani mine site. Um, and yeah, so we are running over time, but um, we are going, we are recording this whole presentation. So if someone misses some of it, we'll send you a link to it via email um, tomorrow. So we'll just continue on. We'll try not to go for too much longer. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we all found that very interesting. So thank you. Um, so I'll try not to talk too long about this. I just wanted to talk about the black-throated finch and the Adani coal and rail project. So we know that the black-throated finch southern subspecies is no longer found across 88% of its historical range. In 2019, there was only an estimated population of around 1,000 left in the wild. The area where Adani wants to dig the Carmichael coal mine is home to the largest known population of black-throated finches and is some of the best remaining habitat. It is estimated that the mine will destroy over 16,500 hectares of black-throated finch habitat and official counts of the black-throated finch at Adani's Carmichael coal mine site recorded an 82% drop between 2019 and 2020, according to the first official survey conducted for Adani. <coughs> Excuse me. So Adani's management plan depends on the theory of creating an offset area. So this means another area is set aside with the theory that uh, when their favourite home is cleared, they will just go to another area instead. Um, the problem in this circumstance with Adani is that the offset area that has been allocated for the finch to <laughs> move to um, is not their preferred habitat. And to make matters worse, it's uh, actually on the site of Clive Palmer's proposed Waratah coal mine. So they don't have a very good... Uh, outlook for that offset idea. Um, yeah, it's unbelievable that this offset area, uh, that it can be called an offset area when it's not even their preferred habitat and it's pretty much the site of another proposed coal mine. Um, unfortunately, that is not a joke. Our governments have approved that. So since Adani's black-throated finch management plan has been approved, Adani has become, begun work on the site and Adani has not managed to follow even their inadequate management plans. They have already breached their environmental management obligations more than five times. These breaches include clearing habitat without a wildlife spotter, illegal clearing of habitat outside the rail corridor area, failing to establish an offset area within the required time frame. So, you know, where the animal's going to go, got nowhere to go. And in October 2020, Adani breached its black throated finch management plan um, when the Queensland Department of Environment and Science uh, observed that cattle stocking rates had exceeded the rates specified in the management plan. So, you know, they're probably having a pretty hard time out there. Mackay Conservation Group has also raised concerns about apparent breaches of sediment and erosion control out at the Adani Carmichael Coal and Rail Project. Um, this sort of water pollution is also a threat to the water sources of the finch. And recently, the Wangana Jagalingu cultural custodians have raised the alarm over a sharp drop in water levels at the sacred Dungabula Springs beside the Adani mine, which is also extremely concerning. So um, 
This paints a bleak picture, yes, but all is not lost as there is still a population of the finch left. They are not extinct yet. And we as a community can step up and save them from extinction. So I'm sure a lot of you who care about the finch would like to know what can you do to help the finch? So I'll just quickly go through some things that we can do um, as citizens. We need to call on the decision makers to do the right thing. So I am asking you to take steps to contact your local MP and contact the state and federal environment ministers and tell them that the remaining black-throated finch habitat must be protected to save them from extinction. They need somewhere to live. If we want to save them from extinction, we need the decision makers to protect that last remaining habitat. So um, Ashley's going to put in the chat now a petition we've made to the uh, both Queensland and federal environment ministers, and also a link where you can find the contact details of your local MP. You can contact them, appeal to their heart inside them to stand up for the black throated finch and to speak up um, to tell the government to protect their habitat. Uh, secondly, something else you could do if you're in central or northern Queensland is join the black throated finch recovery team on their annual waterhole count near Townsville. We'll put the details for those interested in that in the chat. And also rest assured that all these links we're putting in the chat now will be included in a follow-up email um, tomorrow along with the recording. Um, thirdly, um, people could contact Adani and their investors and tell them they must not be complicit in sending a species to extinction. So that's a pretty uh, simple thing that people can, can do. Um, we have a web page with the contact details of the investors of Adani, which we'll put in the chat. And, you know, you can bring them up and say, the Adani coal mine is on um, some of the best black-throated finch habitat. Um, if you don't want to help send this beautiful bird to extinction, you need to stop supporting this coal mine, which is going to wipe them out. And finally, a great thing we can all do is write to newspapers and share social media to help raise awareness of the situation. I think a lot of people don't actually know about the plight of the black-throated finch and a lot of people would be really shocked to know how close this bird is to extinction. Um, so yes, basically contacting decision makers, join the um, waterhole count, contact Adani investors and help spread awareness about the situation. So um, we are, excuse me, we are past um, over time at the moment. Um, Juan, do you still want to spend another 10 minutes for those interested? Um, yes, I can make um, very sh a shorter because um, I also include a little bit on how to, uh, sorry, contact the Blackfriar Finch recovery team and join the, uh, the uh, waterhole count. So maybe I'll skip over that. And I'll just give you a brief overview of what is happening right now in terms of research with the Finch and a final conclusion for me to clarify certain things that I've said during the presentation. Yes, great. Um, that's what I'd really like to hear is um, what your personal conclusions about future research and management would be. So yeah. I'll hand the virtual microphone back over to Juan now. And um, yeah, if you'd just like to spend another five or 10 minutes um, telling us what you think yeah. uh, is going on and should be done. That right. would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just share my screen for a second again. Um, right. Um, Great, so um, I just wanted to leave um, the presentation on a positive note and show a little bit of what we're doing right now. Um, I was gonna talk, talk you through um, that uh, initial chapter that uh, in which we actually put together a list of 
uh, research actions that we uh, thought it was more, were more important um, for the conservation of the finch. I had the input of the recovery team for that chapter actually, and it is now published on, uh, on a scientific journal. So I can send you a link for that if you're interested, but in the interest of time, I might not go into it. I'm just gonna say that in general, the things that we need to do conservation of the finch um, have to do, I would say predominantly on how to share space uh, between pastoralism and conservation. So anything that had to do with improving the way that we do cattle management and fire management to be able to share the space um, on cow grazing properties and black herd finches would be very beneficial to any sort of management, especially if we don't have that option of sparing them. And the other thing that might be important is just doing monitoring. Just a big part of what we don't know about these birds is that, well, we have seen or we have seen that they have disappeared from a lot of areas, but we still don't have a full reliable estimates on how many finches are left or if certain areas that um, are thought to not have finches anymore, still hold some finches. Because as I said, these things are pretty rare, they're hard to find, and they also happen in areas that are pretty unpopulated. So um, I'm still collaborating, if I'm not full-time on this little research project that is just using, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but these boxes that um, uh, Sush here, my, my collaborator, was helping me put in remote areas of central Queensland in those areas that the map showed to be pretty good, that just basically record, we can live on for a week or two weeks or even a month if we have a battery. We attach them to a tree close to a water hole or a, a water source like that one in the left. And we can just bring all of that audio data, put it through a software that automatically identifies the finches. This is still not available. We are working on the software as well to develop it, but Basically, it would be a cheaper and quicker way to just do monitoring and identify finches or no other populations in very remote areas where access is very limited or areas that um, not having someone posted there for every day of the week for a week might make it, might make it very hard to find any finches. So I just wanted to leave you on that positive note. The other thing that I wanted to say, this is the list of actions that um, I was going to show you. But again, um, I'll be happy to show to show to share this over email. Um, so um, don't, don't don't hesitate to contact me about it. Um, I was also going to talk about this the webpage of the recovery team. And apart from the questions, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, I would just wanted to make a um, final conclusion, which is. Um, I already saw some questions in the um, in the chat regarding, well, land sparing is the only thing that we could do. It's not that land sparing is the only thing that we could do, and that's the important bit for me. Um, the conclusion here is that we can do all of this management, we can do all of this research, we can invest money and time into figuring out a magical way, not magical because it's based on science, but just having the hopes that we'll find this answer on how to do conservation on a finch that is already 88% decline, right? We have this, um, we keep putting our targets, our eyes on having this pipe that is leaking because of fire management, grazing management. At the end of the pipe, we're trying to find what are the holes, how to patch them, and we keep putting our focus there. While these results, what they show is that the big hole at the beginning of the pipe is that we have this massive problem with clearing that has driven the, the, the presence of the finch already by 88% and just not realizing and putting conservation in the forefront to address this problem at the root, just focusing on um, what are the core issues? What is the main problem? And making sure that we don't have that those causes because the main cause here is that we've lost the habitat to clearing. It's not that, um, or we might have lost it also to grazing, but uh, if we keep doing clearing, and especially in regards to the Adani mine, if we don't put conservation at the forefront when we have already an endangered species, 
what is the point of investing all of these resources into conservation and research, right? If we don't change uh, the approach that we have to conservation to avoid all these problems altogether, um, the point, sorry, the, the, the actual value that we're gonna get of conservation is gonna be very low. I don't know, I, I think I went a little, in a little bit of a run, but basically I think um, if we are going to address these serious issues, and I think there is a better uh, metaphor there to be work with climate change. For many years, we've known that the main problem that we have with climate change is our emissions. We can try to come up with all these technological solutions, objectives in policy, but if we don't address right now the, the fact that we are emitting too many um, uh, greenhouse gases, um, we are just putting patches to a massive hole, right? So again, I think this was a bit off script, so I don't know if I came across very articulately, but uh, I want you to leave you all with this uh, reflection and to also encourage you to have an influence on the policy because these issues are not solved again by doing more research or more management. They're based, they're solved at the origin of the problem. Um, to do that a lot of the times, uh, the only solution is changing policy. And I think that's me. Wow, thank you. <laughs> That was, um, yeah, I really appreciate, uh, we all really appreciate your conclusion there, Juan. Um, that was wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time tonight and thanks so much everyone for coming. Um, we'll follow up with a recording of, this, uh, we'll send you a link to a recording of this um, entire presentation. We will follow up on some of the questions that were in the chat and we'll also include um, the links to some of those steps that you can take and further information in the follow-up email too so we hope you can tell your friends and family and colleagues about this and um, we hope to see you all again soon have a good night bye thank you everyone